Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor Ralph Hexter, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second event in the 2019-2020 season of the UC Davis Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. The UC Davis Forums was established in 2012. It presents about a half dozen lectures each academic year by experts from a range of disciplines. The series was designed to promote informed and thoughtful dialogue among members of the campus community and the public on the following subjects. The major challenges facing the public university, ways of responding to those challenges, and how the public university is evolving with an ultimate goal of helping to produce a public university that will best serve society and individuals, we pose the following question. What should and can the public university be in the 21st century? In our preceding seven seasons, the UC Davis Forums has presented distinguished speakers on a wide range of topics pertaining to the public university and the social good. These have included educational access and affordability, diminishing public confidence and funding for public institutions, the economic impact of UC campuses on their regions, sexism and racism in the academy, and the relationship between academic mission and neoliberal metrics of success, among many other topics. Our next forum, to be held on January 27th, will feature Shirley Malcolm, Senior Advisor and Director of the Sea Change Program of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. But I invite all of you to visit the series website, forums.ucdavis.edu, to find information about all of the season's events, as well as videos of our past events. This afternoon, we're delighted to welcome California Supreme Court Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar. He will share his views in conversation with Raquel Aldana, Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Diversity and Professor in our School of Law. Before Justice Cuellar is properly introduced by Associate Vice Chancellor and Professor Aldana, I'd like to say how pleased I am personally that we have the privilege of engaging with this distinguished jurist and friend of education today. I had the honor to meet Justice Cuellar several years back when he was the featured speaker for a school of law commencement over which I presided. I was immediately struck by both the importance of his message and the way he conveyed it with passion rooted in personal experience and conviction and with warmth and wit. Since then, I've had the honor to meet with him on several occasions and to learn even more from his deep and humane thinking. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation he'll be having with Professor Aldana, and I trust that you are too. As a final item before that begins, I have a few thank yous and announcements. I'd like to thank all who've made this event possible. First, the UC Davis Forum Steering Committee, led by Martin Kenny, Professor of Human and Community Development, and Associate Vice Chancellor and Professor Aldana, who will be both interviewer and moderator for this event. Next, the campus units that have joined my offers to sponsor this lecture, the Community and Regional Development Program and the Center for Regional Change. Finally, and most importantly, Justice Cuellar for coming to our campus to participate in this special event. One more announcement. After today's presentation, there will be a Q&A period and then a reception in this location. We hope that you can stay for talk and refreshments. Now, let me invite Justice Cuellar and Associate Vice Chancellor and Professor Aldana to uh, their chairs. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. Is this working? Good afternoon. Thank you so much for, for coming. And I, I really want to start by thanking uh, Provost Hexter because it's really um, the reason why we're hosting this forum. Today, he's been a wonderful friend and a, and a supporter. Um, I, um, I can't tell you how delighted I am, Justice Quayer, to have you with us today. Your generosity in your visit alone has been such a gift. Um, for those of you who um, are just meeting him for the first time, we actually hosted a wonderful program at the law school at noon, and we were very intentional to uh, target that program to, to students, and so we had high school students, we had undergraduate students, we had law students. 
And the conversation with the justice was just really joyful, but also intellectually engaging. I thought the questions raised by the students were wonderful, and of course, your answers. Um, so thank you for that. My I, pleasure. I want to say that we conferred upon Justice Cuellar the uh, Cruz Reynoso Sewing Seeds of Justice Award for his dedication to equity and justice. And, and I just wanted to take a moment to, to acknowledge the fact that Justice Cruz Reynoso is still a part of our law faculty here. And of course, many of you know what an incredible legacy he has had at UC Davis as well. So thank you. So um, I decided not to give a formal bio introduction of your incredible life because many of the questions I'm going to ask you will follow you chronologically through, through your life and, and focus on key moments of, Thank your, you. this is much of better. your career. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to share with you that when you were appointed to the bench, I was uh, a law faculty and so as peers, um, you know, we are parts of lots of different groups. And, and I was part of the international law professors, the human rights law professors, the immigration law professors, the administrative law professors, and the overwhelming response was incredible enthusiasm for your appointment. And it was just this idea that you would bring this amazing intellect to the court. But it was also a sense that your dedicated commitment to public service and just the kind of person you are was just going to edify the court with such um, a dignified presence. And I just want to share that with you because Thank it just you. went on for a long time. <laughs> I um, hope I can live see. up to half of that, but I'm <laughs> grateful. So let me, um, let me start with your early childhood. Um, so you uh, were born in Matamoros, Mexico, which is located, for those of you who don't know, um, on the southern bank of the Rio Grande, directly across from Brownsville, Texas. And I understand that you lived in Matamoros, but for some time crossed every day to attend Catholic Junior High in Brownsville. And I'm curious how this experience of growing up in a border town with nearly daily shared living experiences across two nations influenced your identity and perspectives in life. Thank you, Raquel. It's a real honor to be here. And thank you, Provost Exter. You're a friend, and I've learned a lot from you, and uh, Dean Kevin Johnson, and I have other colleagues and friends that I know in the audience. I'm glad that you all are here, and I'm looking forward to making more friends tonight. I, um, I want to get to Matamoros, but first I have to tell you a, a UC Davis story. So uh, as you know what it feels like when you're an assistant professor, you don't have tenure, you're excited about being in academia, about preparing your classes, getting your articles written. You live in some dread that you, know, you won't get tenure or that um, Nobody will ever read your articles. So it was with great joy that after I'd been teaching maybe six months, four months, I got an invitation to come and give a talk at UC Davis Law School. So I came, I had my paper, I got ready to give my talk. This was back, back in the old day, uh, in the early 21st century. I'm thinking circa 2003, where PowerPoints were beginning to be used. Now they're like de rigueur. I'm actually shocked that we don't have a PowerPoint here, but that's great. <laughs> So I had like my little PowerPoint slides, and I got up there to give my talk. And then suddenly, as I was getting ready to start, somebody walked in and sat in the back of the room. And after that, I was completely distracted, because all I could think of is, oh my gosh, Justice Cruz Reynoso's in the back of the room. <laughs> I was so excited to give the talk and to see one of my heroes, Cruz Reynoso. And it means so much to me that I received the Cruz Reynoso Award tonight, because I grew up in the Imperial Valley, moved to California at age 13, after that time, 13, 14 maybe, last, after that time in Matamoros that I'm about to talk about. And I arrived in California just after that retention election had sadly ended with Justice Cruz Reynoso and two others not being retained under the California Supreme Court. And I didn't know what the California Supreme Court was exactly, but I learned a little bit about his history. This man who had worked with farm workers, who had had a career as a law professor, and I just thought, he was a great man, and I was, felt so blessed that he was there in the back of the room taking notes on my talk. Uh, <laughs> but it was a little bit you know, nerve-wracking in a way. So um, how many of you have ever been to the US-Mexico border? Raise your hand if you have. About, about a third of the room. If you have not had the chance to go, please go at some point. It is a remarkable experience to stand right next to the border. Whether you're on the Mexican side looking up towards the US or on the American side looking south towards Mexico, 
you have to remember two things about that border. First thing you have to remember is uh, something very personal, which is that most people who live on, those, on either side of the border have some tie, whether they know it or not, to the other side of the border. So in my family, I had a little bit of family living in Brownsville, Texas, but most of my family lived in Matamoros, and before that in San Fernando and San Luis Potosí, probably like the families of some people in this room. But people on the border on the, on the Brownsville side, even if they didn't have family on the Mexican side, the whole economy of Brownsville depended on the okra and sorghum that was being driven up and crossing the checkpoints or the truck drivers or the you know, electronic stores or the tourist trade. So it was like deep interconnection and yet this real true border. I mean, it was not like a line in the sand. It was like, I mean, these days people talk about a wall like there's never been one. <laughs> There was like a lot of fencing and there was a lot of fortification, a lot of lights, uh, helicopters, and a river, of course. Um, mm -hmm. My grandfather on my mother's side had uh, an, a brother who died um, in that river. Um, mm. I don't think he was trying to cross to permanently come to the US, but not, not infrequently people would cross the, the river informally and mm. he got sucked in by the undertow, which I always mm. felt had kind of deep emotional mm -hmm. resonance. So that's one thing you need to know, that the borders are both separated and yet interconnected. The second thing you need to know, though, is that it's actually a pretty unique border around the world. If you compare the border of Windsor, Canada, and Detroit, Michigan, Canada and the US, that's one of the most frequently crossed border points in the world. But if you look at how wealthy people are on either side of the border, it's actually not that different. You can go to inner city Detroit and find a lot of poverty, but the overall amount of wealth in that region of the US is not so different from in Windsor, Canada. Matamoros is a fairly well-off part of Latin America, but it is very, very poor compared to Brownsville, which is in Cameron County, which was back then the poorest county in Texas and one of the poorest counties in America. So one reason to go to the border is to see what people who grew up on the border see all the time, which is a line demarcating huge disparities in wealth, not just language, not just culture, not just political system, but just wealth, like how the streetlights worked and the whole dynamic and infrastructure was more prosperous on one side. So I think in many ways my time growing up in Matamoros was pretty ordinary uh, for a kid. Uh, in many ways it was not so ordinary. It was ordinary in that you grew up with both English and Spanish around you, mostly Spanish. It was ordinary in which, you know, the sense that you cross over to the border sometimes. And back then, it was not super difficult to get at least a border crossing card. It was ordinary in that I had an extended family living in different parts of Matamoros and bounced around between my grandmother's house on one side of the family, my grandmother's house on the other, and was sent on endless errands to go to butcher shops and peanut shops. And there was a shop for everything. There was like meat shop, the peanut shop, the detergent shop, like the cilantro shop, like everything at a separate shop. <laughs> And you'd walk through the town, and my family, my family, you know, my parents were teachers, but, but they had grown up like in this, the central part of Matamoros, which was very dense, and there were just a lot of street merchants, mm -hmm. and probably not far from my, the place where my family lived, there was sort of like a, a, there was a tourist market, but then there was a much bigger bustling market that people actually used mm -hmm. to buy mostly meat and poultry and like trinkets and clothes. And you'd walk through and you'd hear like, tomate, 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 you know, the, the tomato seller or the mango seller. So that was my environment. It was different in that my father, um, and uh, he, he had been in that sort of first generation of Mexicans in the region who had benefited from the developmental state in Mexico of like actually trying to get people to go to become teachers and to go to normal school. So he had trained to be a PE teacher in a Mexican public school, which he never let me forget. He always argued that I didn't do enough exercise. But, um, but he had um, fallen in love eventually with my mom, uh, but first with basketball. And for a short Mexican, playing basketball was a challenge. <laughs> but he had gotten so good at it that he had actually gotten a scholarship to attend this Catholic school in Brownsville as a kid. Mm. And that was the very same uh, uh, school that gave me a scholarship years later, although mm. not to play basketball. <laughs> and so, so that was like, you catch the point about crossing the border every day. It was to go to St. Joseph Academy and feel grateful for the Maris brothers who gave me the chance to go there rather than to a Mexican public school. Um, but it was, it was complicated because you were very, I would say, I'll end with this. 
you were kind of paradoxically aware that there were all these distinctions of geography, nationality, and class. Mm -hmm. And yet you were also aware that those were very permeable at the same mm -hmm. time. And that was what was weird. It was mm -hmm. paradoxical. Like you mm -hmm. thought you can cross the border, but it is a total fact of life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when the stars align a certain way, the immigration official is just going to send you back and it doesn't matter if your documents are in order. Mm -hmm. But I loved it. Like I learned a lot and I have lots of memories of my grandparents mm -hmm. and going to buy the meat mm -hmm. at the butcher shop. Thank you for that. Um, earlier, actually, you talked a little bit about a different type of uh, barrier or border, if you will, which is more of a geographic barrier, um, being both a product of California in many ways, but, but experience it distinctly depending on geography. So you, you, you talked about the fact that at age 14, you, uh, your parents all moved uh, to reside in the Imperial Valley uh, Calexico, to be more exact. And there, actually, you also went to a local high school. So you went from being in a private uh, Catholic school to a public school. And I'm wondering both how experiencing public education, but specifically in the Central Valley, has also shaped your identity. Um, in a big way. I think in some ways, like my love of California and my hope to try to see it as one integrated whole comes from having been like blessed to move to California, but I went from Cameron County, Texas, which is the poorest county in Texas, to Imperial Valley uh, County, which was the poorest county in California. And I felt super lucky, super excited, but it was not lost on me that this was not the California that was depicted in the movies. Like <laughs> I thought, okay, it's not San Diego, it's not that, like it's 120 degrees in the shade. There are lots and lots of farm workers. Lot, like in, so Calexico High School, when I, moved there. My dad got a job teaching Spanish at the high school. That's why we ended up in Calexico. Was about 70% limited English proficiency. And it was like 91%, maybe 93% Latino. Interestingly, like 6% Asian, because there were lots of um, Chinese Americans who had moved to work on the railroads, I gather, and eventually had started businesses in northern Mexico. So they had a kind of shared existence across borders. But um, I do remember the very first time we crossed the border, the, the other kind of border, which is over the, the mountains to go to San Diego. Mm. And I, it boggled my mind that I actually thought that Calexico and Mexicali were more like in the same place mm. than Calexico and San Diego. I thought it's just extraordinary that people live with built-in air conditioning here. They, like the ocean is there and there's all this development. And... I think California is beautiful and complicated because we somehow have to hold in our mind that it's both Calexico and San Diego. Mm -hmm. And there's always a version of that story, mm -hmm. whether it's like Fresno and San Jose or, you know, Sacramento and, you know, parts of San Bernardino like that. And I, th I think those divides are incredibly difficult to bridge, but they're, but they're crucial to bridge. And when I think about part of what holds California together, the courts, the water project, the University of California, like the roads, it's often about trying to bridge those divides. Mm -hmm. Let me say one more thing about this because it's something I'm struggling these, with these days and I don't know quite what to make of it. So I've gotten really interested in how technology changes us but doesn't change us. And I still remember the first time I ever used the internet. I don't, like some of, how many of you remember the first time you ever used the internet? Like sent an email or web page. How many of you do not remember that? Okay. <laughs> Every year there will be more of you in the room. <laughs> I still remember, and I remember back then, this is the early 90s, there was this buzz about how the internet was going to erase geography. It was going to make it so that you could work in Nebraska, or like in Inyo, or in like Placerville, or in like whatever, and you could be anywhere because, you know, you could, that's the internet. Mm -hmm. And like 25 or 30 years in, what's really interesting to me is that the opposite has happened. Like if anything, I would say, there's more clustering of wealth, power, like education in a s smaller and smaller uh, chunk of places. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is odd to me, like what to make of that. Like I do think we've all benefited in a lot of ways from the internet, but we ought not to feel okay about how those benefits seem to be clustering more and more mm. geographically. Mm. Interesting. You, I love the language that you use and you talked about um, how growing up in a border town made you aware of how permeable uh, 
spaces can be, including spaces of deep inequality. And in many ways, your life is really about being incredibly permeable, if you will, because you've occupied um, spaces that are usually don't, don't go together. So for example, you are a, a byproduct of three of the most uh, selective private institutions in higher education, uh, undergrad at Harvard College, uh, JD at Yale, if that wasn't enough, doctorate at Stanford. Um, and I guess I want to ask you, um, what is the role of these institutions in helping others permeate borders? I struggle with that. I think that's a terrific question, and it's probably one that runs through your position at Davis, too, because, I mean, sort of like what I said about Calexico, San Diego, Mexicali, I think in some ways Harvard, Stanford, Yale, and UC Davis are more similar than UC Davis is with some of the community colleges in our state that are educating immigrants and are educating people who are getting a chance to come into higher education, or frankly, than you know, some of the four-year colleges that also are struggling to provide a full education to people. That said, like between public higher ed and these private institutions are also some big differences. And I think it's important to remember that we have never in society, even in a very democratic society that's committed in principle, the constitutional governance, like solve the problem of inequality. And I don't know that we ever will. But one thing that makes America Im like importantly great in my mind is that we are not satisfied with ourselves and we self-examine. And I think, so like a Harvard, a Stanford, even a UC Davis, I think, we, we think of ourselves as institutions that are American and also global. People come here from all over the world. But the American part of the, all these institutions to me is about self-examination of how we are connected to that inequality and how we can reduce it a little. So that includes to me like at least three different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Like one question to ask is who is getting the chance to study here? Because mm -hmm. you will never be able to accommodate all the people who could benefit greatly from that and who could contribute to the institution. There are just too many people and too few slots. The second question is who are we inviting to be permanent members of our community? I will say for better or worse, and it's probably a little of both, I've been around a lot of universities, and what you really take away from it is the faculty are really the ones who are in charge, like of the culture of the place. Okay. And I think for better and worse, like faculty are great, but also we all have our blinders on in different ways. And so who are those people? What are their values? And a third way to think about it is, even if you can't accommodate like the full range of life experiences among your students and among your faculty, though I think you should try, how is that institution partnering with others to share the benefit of its knowledge? And so, so during the Cold War, Americans didn't have a lot of trouble realizing why research was so important. It was about making America the most prominent country in the world, defending the system of government we had. I think since then, people sometimes struggle to see why that research mission really matters to them, particularly the struggling communities that are more poor. And I feel like some of that gap has to be leveled by the universities themselves. Mm -hmm. And whether you pick leaders or faculty or students who are gonna feel like an impatience and a hunger to see like what collaboration you can have with a community college or how it is that you can help a social service agency deliver mental health services more effectively or figure out like how to clean up the pollution in the New River which was not far from my house in Calexico. It's not like there are like very few problems to solve. And the irony is that a university works in part because it lets you get away from all that and have this like separation from the rest of society, but I think it's gotten to be too large. And there's probably lots of things that, I appreciate the power that you give faculty, there's probably lots of things we, we, we can't change on our own at least, the structural inequalities that create these barriers, but there are other things. Where and teaching classes on Friday, by yeah. the way, I don't know if <laughs> te classes are taught on Friday at Davis, but. Very few institutions I've ever found right. can actually manage to teach classes on right. Friday. Yeah, yeah. But that's a small so point. That's something we could change. Yeah. Um, another thing that actually has been um, discussed lately, and it's, it's being driven by, by uh, the UC Academic Senate, is whether to continue to consider standardized exams as part of this admissions process um, based on questions of their utility and also fairness insofar as they have been gatekeepers to certain, um, to keep out certain um, students from these institutions. 
I wondered if you could share your thoughts generally on standardized tests as a measure of skills, qualities, or other characteristics that colleges and law schools should be looking for in their students. So I'm going to tell you the story of what it was like for me to take the bar exam. Uh, I don't know if we have any law students in the room. I, I, I don't want to traumatize you because you'll get through the bar, you'll do great. But when I took the bar, and I'll get to you know the SAT, ACT, but when I took the bar, I was, um, I was frustrated by the fact that I had to take the bar. I, it was three days back in my day, and it was just going to be painful. I thought, there, there's a way you've got to approach the bar exam, which is it's not about like how deeply you can think about a particular issue. It's basically, do you know the, the thing that goes with what? Like, what goes with what? Like, if they ask you, you know, if somebody, this was literally a question on the bar exam the, the year that I took it, I remember it, it was a stand, like a, a multiple choice question. If, if you are at a, if you are like walking through a city and somebody is giving a historical tour of the city and you just join the tour and you're listening and you're taking notes and it's really interesting and the person says, well, this is you know, the first building in UC Davis, it's like historically important, it's where the UC farm began and et cetera, et cetera, and this is the Student Resource Center and you know, Ralph Hexter spoke there once, it's a really big deal, like whatever. Like if, and then at the end of that tour, the, the person who's giving the tour sends you a bill. Uh, are you obligated to pay that because of the doctrine of quasi-contract? Are you obligated to pay that because, in fact, it was a contract and you're obligated because of that? Are you not obligated to pay it? Or are you obligated to pay it because of, you know, equitable whatever? And I, I thought to myself, this is just so painful. Um, I mean, I'm not saying lawyers shouldn't know that, but it was not, I, I didn't love that experience. Afterwards, I was so done with the bar exam, uh, I hoped, that I, I, I took it in Oakland. I took the BART across, and I got on the Muni, and I got all the way to Ocean Beach, and I walked into the ocean. I don't think I took anything off. I just walked into the ocean and cleansed. And I, like somewhere along the way, like the pens and everything I had just all like got shed. So I guess I'm trying to convey that I don't think we have solved the problem of testing in our society because it's just like, like when I was in college, a professor said to me something that stuck in my brain. I was explaining why I was like frustrated with economics as a discipline. And he said, you're frustrated because you think the economic models don't capture the full complexity of life. And I'm like, yes! And he said, the best model of a cat's brain is a cat's brain. But then we wouldn't learn much of anything about how the cat works. And you, you could argue with me, but unless you want to spend all your time like literally building a replica of the cat's brain, you've got to simplify some things. And I guess I have that conflicted reaction to testing because I feel like it is a fact that we cannot replicate the full complexity of everybody's life, but we need some data. And as an administrative law person, I worry about putting all the pressure to sort students on teachers because our teachers are heroic and they're great, they're so talented, but they make mistakes. And there are people who just are more capable than what their grades would say. And although I know these tests have been sometimes barriers and they've been found to be biased in different ways and they've changed over time to get a little less so. I also worry about a system, like there's no getting rid of the human element and I worry about just putting all of it on the teachers. So I would say, let's keep at it and trying to make more fair, more reasonable assessments, not put too much weight on them, but definitely make them part of the picture so we can understand a little bit more of the complexity of people's lives. So I'm gonna push you a little bit to, to um and, and only because I will confess, this is a, an issue that perhaps unduly influenced my um, temporary, perhaps, departure from, from teaching law. Because I, I do feel that the emphasis on how we license lawyers on a, on a bar exam, particularly in California with its high cut score, has, has really um, had an impact beyond just the stress of students and your experience of walking into to the ocean after the taking the bar, it's actually in many ways also had an impact in the way we teach and, and, and what we teach and how we teach. Um, and, um, and I guess I wanted to ask you, how, can, we, can we become more creative about the way we license perhaps lawyers or the way we think about assessing, assessing um, the characteristics that we think are important for different professions or different disciplines of study? I think emphatically yes. 
full stop. Okay. Great. So, that was easy. <laughs> yeah, but, but okay, I mean, so now that you know that I think the answer is yes, I'm, I'm going to add just a bit of the complexity, right? But, but it's a hopeful complexity, right? Like, I don't love the bar exam, and I don't think we're done developing better ways to get a sense of whether people are at the point where they can, like, be, be given the great privilege of representing Californians as lawyers, right? I feel like in some ways we have historically been a little bit too cautious in California and not experimented enough. We like to be leaders in California. We like to be innovators when we can reasonably be around how we are inclusive in society or how we develop new kinds of institutions or how the UC got developed in the master plan. And I think here when I look at the bar exam, it's kind of very 20th century. So like, could I imagine a system that uses some you know, partly uses technology, partly uses a better sense of what lawyers do day to day. So we make this less painful, more inclusive, like not so likely to monopolize too much of the teaching process. Mm -hmm. I think yes, and I hope that we can all work together, including not only like the state bar, but academics, scholars from law, from psychology, from education, to do something that works a little better. Great. And I have to ask you a legal question. I think of sometimes course. too much emphasis when we're critiquing standardized tests, too much emphasis is, is placed on the, on the equality issues, but I do think they matter. Um, so we do know that these metrics that we are currently using do yield disparate results across racial lines and across economic lines. And, um, and I wonder if you could provide s some guidance on how we ought to think about questions of legality um, under state and federal anti-discrimination laws as it applies to these. Uh, standardized test. So I have to be a little general because some of this yes. could end up in the courts. But I would say I think we should approach them with ambition and thoughtfulness, right? Like we would be pretty sad if, um, if the process of admitting people to selective colleges now worked basically the same way it did in the 1940s, which was heavily driven by, oh, do I recognize this particular school that you come from? And is it a good school that produces good people? Let, never mind that a whole bunch of the population may not have a chance to go to that particular school. Like, before we even get to the issue of like, what was your circumstance at home? Or, you know, how good were your teachers? Just like even like that. Or geography was a big barrier for people, or race, or sex, gender, right? So uh, we, we aren't in the same place, and I don't want us to be in the same place in 20 years. That said, I feel like um, the testing piece is complicated because it has been exclusionary in some ways, I gather, like as I look at the research historically, but it was also a means through which people gained access who otherwise didn't have it, right? So there's a kind of yin and yang there, but I feel like to go back to a previous point that we were talking about, like I don't want us to ever be satisfied. I think it's like squeezing out imperfections while leaving some opportunity people show their excellence in different ways. And hopefully different ways that will include the challenges that they've had to overcome, like the geographic circumstances, the family circumstances, the ways in which sometimes they don't get the support among the schooling that they get that other kids get. I still feel like I think the, this is what I'm also getting at. Like I'm perfectly willing to say we aren't where we need to be on the testing, but I think that the underlying issue in the background is there are some incredibly talented people all over California and all over the country, and opportunity is not distributed equally to them. And so what we do about that may impact testing a little, but I think it's more fundamentally about K-12 education, about curriculum, about access to great teachers, about the use of technology, about supporting parents, and all that. Thank you. I meant to keep track of time, and, I'm, and then I'm not, so. <laughs> People are still here, so that's ask, a good yes, sign. and Hopefully. I can ask lots of questions, but okay. if at any point I'm going on for too long, I'm going to look at you and, and tell me to give me some guidance. But um, I do actually want to ask you this question, because I think it's important. And you, you, you said when I asked you about mm -hmm. the role of higher education and equity, to, to restate it broadly, you talked about the role of faculty and the importance of having faculty who reflect values that, that, that think about these issues. And I guess I want to personalize it a little mm -hmm. bit more to ask you, how do you think it mattered to have a Latino Mexican born as part of the faculty at Stanford? 
Well, I think that there was no question. I'm, I'm just going to start with the most basic reaction I have to the question, which is it's a great privilege for me when I think back of all the time I've been as a, a teacher, a professor, that sometimes students come up to me and say, you know, it made a difference to me that you were in the classroom. Maybe you shared something about what administrative law, how that operates based on your experience crossing the border every day or working at the Treasury and seeing the disconnect between the impact the border might have on literally the public health of the people who might be like breathing exhaust fumes for an hour and a half waiting to cross the border and how disconnected that is from the policymakers in DC who actually are responsible for border policy. And that made a difference to me. Or knowing that you have strong ties to places like Alexico, Matamoros, Brownsville, that made a difference to me. Or knowing that you took a little extra time to talk about something in family circumstances and share your own story about your family, that made a difference to me. And that has happened more times than I ever imagined. It's also made more of a difference on me. Like there are times when I just wouldn't have thought about that and I love that I'm reminded of it. Um, I think it's had a difference, it's made a difference also on my sense of impatience with the institutions that I'm a part of. And I wanna be like clear, I don't, I know that all institutions that are big are complicated and they have a lot of different constituencies, but when I ran the Institute for International Studies at Stanford, I thought it's great if we're producing research about how the international system works or how like changing geopolitics are affecting European security. But I also want to know like how the research our faculty are doing are affecting the way refugee camps are being designed because I feel like there's an urgency around that and some of it probably comes down to crossing borders and feeling like my story's a little bit implicated in all that. So there are probably other ways in which what's surprising to people is that despite a lot of social differences between me and the next faculty member, we might still deeply agree on some things, like that a university has to be inclusive to different points of view politically that may not be popular. That when we gather people together after an election and say to people, hey, many of you might have felt really discombobulated by what just happened, it may not have been what you expected, we might also have to think carefully about how are people gonna be feeling who might have voted for the person who won that election, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is a real challenge. There are other challenges too, obviously, but I feel like that's an important one mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. But one of those reasons is that when things go wrong at a university community, people are impacted for their whole careers. They get a certain set of perceptions and views or maybe lose an opportunity to build bridges that might serve them really well in the future. I could go on, on and that, but I'm gonna. I'm and gonna you ask. should, right? <laughs> it's, it seems like there's a follow up on the tip of your tongue, and I want to hear it. Like, if you want to talk more about it. Well, because I, I think partially I connect dots too, like you. And so you talked about the the dangers of technology, for example, in in polarizing. And I think about our own context, and and therefore, what are the mechanisms that we have to counterbalance those things that are happening in society? And you sort of started to allude to that is the role of higher education to help us do that. But it's, but it, it's become actually quite difficult uh, uh, to, to, to do that because some of the things that we have to think about as faculty is power inequities. So these conversations that are sometimes painful or, or hate speech, understanding that it's not inconsequential. So both respecting the values that you're discussing while at the same time being mindful of, of both how our students come to it and how they experience it, it that debate. I, I think that, that is extremely sense. eloquent and it makes me actually especially happy that you're in exactly the position you're in because I feel like this, I'm gonna unpack what you said, like my version of it, but sure. I, think, I think that dealing with these issues requires a lot of leadership and creativity and principle. So the way, you know, one version of what you said that resonates with me is it's really nice at this level of generality to say we should be very supportive and affirming of how we welcome people with differences and also how we accept people who have different backgrounds and whether they're you know, from Fresno or from the Silicon Valley or Imperial Valley or whether, you know, whatever sexual orientation, like we're inclusive and we expect everybody to be respectful to each other. But we also welcome differences of point of view. And by the way, no place in society like a university can actually train you to work closely 
with people who disagree with you. And by the way, now I'll add my own personal experience. Nothing that I really value that I've done in my career, including raise my kids, but especially the policy stuff I've done uh, or the legal stuff in the court, have I ever accomplished without working really closely with people who disagree with me on some things. Like they agree with me on some things, but they disagree on others. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is like, that's great. Now let's get to the specifics. And what if somebody says, well, it's my legitimate point of view that we have too much immigration in this country. And somebody else says, well, you're talking about me and about my family. How am I supposed to feel? How are we going to have that conversation in a respectful way? And I, I got to say, I think that there's no getting past the fact that that's a difficult line to thread, but that universities are the only place that I can point to that are actually laboratories for how you do that effectively. So how you train people to say something like, may I offer my respect for your point of view that we could argue legitimately about the level of immigration a country has, the impact it has on the labor market, the impact it has on culture and language, but also as somebody who's lived through that process and been affected sometimes by the views of people who don't welcome immigrants and you know, may rush to condemn something I do because they just don't like immigrants, that it's a sensitive subject. And you know, we could probably learn from each other to understand each other better and see where we have common ground and where honestly we don't when we have a disagreement. But that's difficult. Thank you for that. Um, I want to switch a little bit to talk a little, uh, to talk some about, um, more about educational equity now from the perspective of K through 12, because your career, you've done so much, including being a member of the U.S. Department of Education uh, Equity and Excellence Commission. So this commission uh, was charged to provide advice to the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education on disparities um, in K through 12. Um, it issued a report in 2013 titled The Strategy for Education, Equity, and Excellence for Each and Every Child. Quite ambitious. Um, the, um, that was very diplomatic. The, it, the was, it was very <laughs> ambitious. <laughs> the recommendations were equally ambitious and focused on a lot of structural reforms like reforming school financing and the quality of instruction and mitigating poverty infusing K through 12 with accountability. And then it was dismantled. Um, and I don't necessarily want you to focus on that, but perhaps putting us in forward in the future, I want to talk a little bit about the state of uh, K through 12 education in California. So there was a 2018 report by the Campaign for College Opportunity on state of higher education for Latinx students. And it found some positive and some hard things. And the positives is that we now have higher rates of high school graduation among Latinos, 89%. And more of them are going on to college, 1.3 million according to 2017 data. But even so, only two in five Latinx students graduate with a high school with a high school with a C or better, which is necessary to attend a public four-year university. Um, and I guess I want to ask you what you think California should be doing better for our students. I don't think there's any policy area that better reflects both what's good and uh, not working with America than public education. And I want to go back and just say two things before I get to the report, which I think still is very current in some ways and very relevant to your question. First thing I want to say is I want everybody in this room to just imagine for a moment that you can have a conversation with one person, and that person is a teacher who's made a really, really big difference in your life. Somebody that's taught you something profound about values or about how to think about math problems or about how to think about history. And I don't think there's probably any of us in this room who can't think of one person pretty quickly that comes to mind who fits that bill. But I think that there are far too many people in America for whom that's a difficult question. And it's not just that the teachers are not trying hard. It's that all kinds of things are going wrong to complicate that process at home, in their communities, with the paint peeling off their classrooms, with the paint being lead paint, like any number of things you and I could list. So one thing that I think has been important for America, and this is the second thing I want to say as context, in addition to just how important teachers are to everything, is that we are facing like some of these difficulties and frustrations because we've actually gotten a lot more ambitious about what we expect from public education. So what I have often rejected is the sense that it was all great once upon a time in the 50s or 60s or 40s or whenever 
because actually we never had set out to educate everybody. And that's an extraordinary thing. Like I would say, before we even get to all the things that are going wrong and all the things that are going right, the best thing that is happening in public education is that we don't actually have the model in a lot of other advanced industrialized countries where the assumption is that just not everybody is fit to be educated to, finish, to even finish high school, let alone go to college. That that's something that should be rationed. We don't, in principle, want to ration a, high, a good high school education. Obviously, the more we've taken that commitment seriously, the more it's become painfully clear how massive the gap is between that commitment and the reality, which kind of sucks for a lot of people. And, and one thing that is difficult for me as a scholar and was difficult in working on the report was that if you care about the issue and if you've lived through the differences that people can actually experience in education, in public, in public K-12 education, you actually have a sense of impatience and urgency about it. Mm -hmm. And yet, a lot of the data we have, I would say fairly interpreted, and this is you know, something relevant to your work too, is that change takes time, right? Like there's almost never a situation where like a superintendent comes in who's brilliant and she's got the right approach and she just gets the right test in and says the right thing to the teachers and just changes compensation, this little tweak and the school board's behind her and then it all is great like after two years. So like I struggle between the sense that this takes like time, even in one single school, and the sense of impatience of how many generations of kids go through and then um, are affected by that mediocrity. Now in the report, what we tried to do is to take 27 or so people who were all leaders in education, from union presidents of the biggest presidents in, uh, unions in the country, to scholars, to like state education officials, to university professors, to advocates for school choice and charter schools, and to see if there was actually a way for us to produce a unanimous document. And I pulled a lot of my hair out, uh, but, uh, but being the co-chair of that commission was a huge privilege, and working together with Chris Etley, who is a UC colleague that I greatly admire and respect, uh, we got a unanimous report. And we agreed on a couple things, but it was a close call. There were many nights where I thought we were just, it was gonna collapse under its own weight. We agreed, number one, that uh, teachers are at the center of things. Uh, that you know, there is no story you can tell, absent like some really new technology that we don't have yet, where this can actually scale and affect millions of kids without like having the teaching profession be well supported, pulling in great people into teaching, compensating them well, giving them good feedback. We also agreed that money matters, but just as much it matters to know how it's spent and to know that it worked well. So you need a kind of assessment system that's continuously validating where the dollars are going. And then we further agreed that even the, the w best funded and highest performing school districts in America were not always doing like super well relative to the rest of the world. So we shouldn't think of this as like, oh, we have the perfect system, we just need to make it available to everybody. There was actually a set of curricular questions and innovation questions we needed to be facing. I was really heartened by the fact we had that level of agreement in the commission, and part of the result was that we took the, um, we were another voice that was added to the debate over the No Child Left Behind law that kind of put some more nails in the coffin of that law, and now we have the Every Student Sees Act, which is not perfect, mm -hmm. but it's at least a step in the right direction, right? Where, where we don't have the idea, which I think was always far-fetched to begin with, but never worked in any event, that if a school was not performing well, what you should do to get it to perform well was threaten it by you know, saying that you might take away further resources that would, of course, you know, affect the kids in an adverse way. So now we have a system where assessment plays a role, but it isn't quite as punitive, and we have a mix of different levers that we hope to pull, but we struggle. I don't think we're done with this issue. I will say, and I have to be very general about this because litigation does come up about education equity, but nobody has all the solutions, right? Not the legislature, not the executives, not the universities, not the courts, but everybody has some role to play. Mm. Listening to you, I'm, um, I realize, uh, so I was uh, co-chair of our Hispanic Serving Institution report here at UC Davis, and I thought I had a big task ahead of me, yet you were trying to solve uh, K through 12 education nationally, so I, uh, <laughs> But you can see what it feels like, right? And, yeah. and by the way, I think we both probably experience a sense of well-meaning, thoughtful people who are just good folks who just think the other person is completely insane at yeah. times, right? Yeah. But 
But I do want to ask you, um, and I've just been given the, the time heads up, and I'll, 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 but I have to ask you this question, and then I will tell you what I didn't get to in case the audience would like to, okay. to ask those questions, just because I want to control the conversation. Um, but in, it, so moving away from K through 12, where there's more agreement, at least in, among the international community, that it should be a universal right, that access should be universal, that there ought to be some quality control with higher education, that's, there's less consensus around that. Uh, but at least in California, you know, we came up with the 1960 California Master Plan for Higher Education that suggested a, a model of universal access, but also created within that a, a hierarchy, if you will. And so when we were writing the report for the Hispanic Serving Institution, I was most struck by this data point, which I didn't know before we started working on it, which is that despite the fact that the system is becoming Hispanic serving in the state of California, we are so elitist or exclusive, institutions of exclusion is a term I'm borrowing from President um, Crow from Arizona State University, that we actually only educate 4% of the 1.3 million Latinx students in California. And that really struck me. And I guess I wanted to ask Does you, that include community colleges? So, the, so oh, we, the UC system, uh, UC, only educates oh, gotcha. 4%. 72% okay. right. end up going to community college. Gotcha. And we know that once they go down that path, uh, you know, I, I, I do, I'm a big proponent of community colleges, but the leak is, is really high in terms of transfer, in term, terms of com completion, and so on and so forth. And so it starts to create these in in inequities throughout. And I guess this is a big question. Answer it how you would want. But is it time to rethink the uh, California Master Plan for Higher Education from the perspective of equity? So the Master Plan was developed like 1960, am I right? Is that, OK. So the answer, yes, of course, it has to be rethought, because I don't know of anything that was created in 1960, except my friends who were born then, that doesn't need to be rethought, right? <laughs> so we, and why do we need to rethink it? Well, we need to rethink it because at that time, California's, I mean, let's just think about a couple of factors, right? Technology is different. The proportion of foreign-born Californians is different. Higher education financing is different. The amount of funding that UC could reasonably expect from the state was different. The number of U CSU campuses was different. Like, so many things were different. Like, LA County had like 2,000 people in it, and now it has like 12 million. Like, it's very different. But, um, but there, is a, there is a very beautiful thing in the California Higher Education Master Plan that I hope will not get lost. And then a very painful reality. Like, my daughter is into musicals, so I'm thinking if I were to make a musical about the California uh, Master Plan for higher <laughs> education, which probably is a crazy idea, there would be songs about this, right? Mm. So one song would be about how everybody deserves a leg up. It doesn't matter who you are. There is a place for you in the California higher education system. I love that, right? And that's reflected in how our community colleges are supposed to not turn mm. people away, how even in the most elite UC campuses like UC Davis, you got some people who come here who were away from college for 17 years and they're back. Um, that's awesome. Mm. I, I want that song to be the end of act one, right? Mm. But maybe the song, or maybe that should be the song at the end of the musical actually. The song at the end of act one is gonna be like, is gonna be the tragedy of sorting and of hierarchy, right? Like, I don't think you or I love the idea of hierarchy. When I write a judicial opinion, and sometimes people want to talk about the court below, to talk about the appellate court that reviewed the case before it got to the Supreme Court of California, I don't like that language for reasons you could understand, and I try not to do that, right? And yet, we have a society and we have a set of constraints that sometimes require us to make judgments about where, I mean, it's true, if you want to run a research university, then the per student funding is going to look very different um, and the infrastructure you need and all that. And I, I guess I'm a pragmatist about that. I want great research to be done at public institutions and I think that means that the UCs are going to be different from the CSUs and different from the community colleges. But if that's going to have to be the case, then two conditions have to be met, to my mind. One, each institution should feel like they serve the entire state of California, right? So if the UC has to be choosy about who can be here, support the research enterprise, take certain kinds of classes, we ought to give 
uh, real due attention to partnering with institutions that are serving others and getting our research to have an impact there. Two, we need to make sure that access is fair, right? So that it doesn't mean that you are not able to go to a UC simply because you didn't go to the most exclusive high school or live in the right zip code, right? And that takes real effort. So when I hear about a community college student transferring to UC Davis or Berkeley or UCLA, that makes my heart sing, and that would be in the song, because that's a small way that we do this, but it's, to me it's like really pregnant with meaning. There's like a lot in that transfer that I would like to see spread throughout the system. That's so beautiful. Um, I didn't get to ask about transnational issues. I really wanted to get to immigration stuff, NAFTA too. I'm shocked to hear you say you wanted to talk about immigration, <laughs> and having known you for years. But I, but I have to end with this question, and then I'll, I'll leave it up to the audience. Um, and I appreciate, because I did share these questions before with um, Justice Cuellar, just to make sure I was asking it correctly. But the US Supreme Court is being asked to decide DACA. And I just want to ask you, what challenges do you think the justices face in deciding such a case? That's a very artfully asked question. Uh, I think that we, I mean, here's the weird irony of how people think of the legal profession and then the reality of the cases that end up in the US Supreme Court, like the DACA case. There are so many technical aspects of the legal profession citing precedent the right way, making sure that you have a good sense of jurisdiction, like who's the right plaintiff, surely that matters. Otherwise, it would be very hard for me to imagine our institutions working anywhere near effectively or fairly, and I would go crazy. But there's also a public civic conversation about really hard stuff that happens in a particular language and setting, but is like about profound things. So on the one hand, I would say that well, let me put it this way. I think the biggest challenge for anybody working on a case like that is to recognize that it is a case about multiple things about this at the same time. It is a case about pragmatism, about the reality of how much we can allow our laws to accommodate to a social reality. It is a case about the power of Congress. It is a case about the powers of the presidency. It is a case about the discretion of mid-level to lower-level federal officials. It's actually a, a case to some extent about the power of a particular administration at any one moment in time versus another that comes later. It's a case about what justifications have to be given for when government does something, and especially for when government stops doing something that it had already started doing. So once you look at it with that level of complexity, I don't think anybody can view it as an easy case even if many, many people can understandably see it as an issue of deep moral principle and big consequence for people. But it's just to say that courts have to then be thoughtful about grappling with all those different levels of conversation. And my hope is that wisdom is going to be defined in part by the ability of the justices to have that. It's kind of like when you look at a, an optical illusion on a page and your vision can zoom in and see one image, but then you look at it from a slightly different angle and you see another. Okay and somehow have to keep both images in your mind at the same time. Well, you've gotten a taste of why we and the legal community were so excited when uh, Justice Cuellar was, was named to Thank the you. bench. Um, please um, join me in thanking uh, Justice Cuellar, letting him drink some water before we ask some questions. Very generous. So we have a mic, and uh, just raise your hand, and we'll uh, make sure that you get a mic. By the way, if you have like another engagement and have to go, don't feel guilty. I'm totally okay with that, but I'm I'm very happy to answer all the questions that I can. Anybody? Yeah. Wait for the mic. <laughs> So thank you so much for the conversation. It was really insightful. Um, I was, um, I have a question uh, really about tuition costs here at the UC, because you were talking about access to the university um, and these policies that you've passed to create more equity within the K through 12 um, grade levels. And I know Raquel also talked about sort of these leaks that happen with students in the community college sort of transferring over into UC. 
But I think some of the things that I've seen is that there are so many students, students of color, who do have the capacity with high marks on their standardized tests that can get into a UC school, but cannot pay for the tuition. There are not enough scholarships, there are not enough fellowships to go around to pay for students or to give that access to those students and those um, sort of under-resourced or you know, students of color that don't necessarily have the funds to enter into UC. So as a justice, I guess what I want to know is what you're doing to sort of control right, the UC's uh, continued sort of increase of tuition um, at UC schools as well as Cal State's. Thank you for your question. So I, um, as, a, as an educator, as a person who cares about higher education, as somebody who's involved in higher ed governance, I care a lot about tuition and think about it. Honestly, as a justice, it's a little different because I got to wait for the disputes to come before me, and then when they come, I decide them with my colleagues. But, but I got to say, like, it feels to me like the real backdrop for your question, which ultimately is both, it gives me a little hope but a lot of concern, <laughs> is that the whole basic model for funding higher education has kind of collapsed from how it existed, you know, a generation ago. So one way to describe it in the past is a lot of high quality higher education was state funded. State supported that higher education in fairly big ways as just a direct check that was written to the university system. In exchange, the uh, tuition was sort of kept a little bit prudent. That didn't rise so quickly. Higher education tuition in the public institutions, you could say sort of discipline the private ones a little because it would kind of shame them too much if they were raising tuition like 10% a year and the public higher education tuition was more flat. And the federal government also kicked in a ton of funding for a lot of reasons. Partly it was science and health. Partly it was concerned about the Cold War, which also kicked in funding for fellowships for language and culture and history study. And, uh, and I would say also you could say there were these big private philanthropies that were very interested in supporting uh, you know, institutions of higher learning because they would, they would think this was a good investment in the future. And all of that subsidized, in effect, like a really big, elaborate process where not everything fell on the backs of the students. To this day, not everything falls on the back of the students, like if you look at the whole funding picture. But that mo funding model is changing, as you can tell. Like, you know, federal government is retrenching. States are not writing as big checks as they used to. They're still very supportive of community college, less so of CSU, even less so of UC. And even philanthropists, like in my neck of the woods in Silicon Valley, they use words like scale and impact and accountability and measurement. And, you know, I've always believed that that actually does match the university world. But they, if they want impact now, like, you know, how many, you know, malaria deaths can you avoid now? That's very different from saying, I want to support a system that is going to make education more available for people so that over a generation, it's going to improve. So that, I think, has left universities in a tough spot because they do need funding. And some of it is maybe appropriate for students to bear if they're going to benefit as much as I think they can from a great college. But I think we have been remiss in uh, failing to fully realize how much that is really difficult for some people and how much we have to do something about it. So when I, like another piece of why this is difficult, as the provost knows, is like the sticker price of higher education often is not the full picture. Like you gotta ask like how, what are people's financing options? Which then means if you're getting some kind of private loan, you're gonna be paying off interest for a long time. Uh, but then there's financial aid, which then is sort of subtracted from that. So some combination of greater transparency, greater honesty, uh, greater ability to convince the sources of funding that this is a good investment to make, greater uh, vehicles for funding so that maybe a small percentage of future earnings, if you earn a lot of money, like maybe that's fair. I think all of that together can help us, but in the meantime, we've got to buy some time and not let this be a runaway thing. I will observe that I think that um, higher education tuition inflation is, has declined a bit, so the increases are still happening, but they're happening less fast. So that gives me a little hope, but it's a, it's a troubling picture. But it'll come back. Thank you. Um, there has been some 
discussion in the last year, year and a half, about the need to revisit the master plan. What is it going to take to make it start happening today and not another 50 years from now? I don't know. That's a very good question. I think that there are good people around California higher ed that want some reexamination. Like I'm, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't have deep insight into the governor's priorities here, but I have, you know, I follow this as some people do in the room and I look at the budgets. And I think if one were to imagine a conversation about this, I would imagine the governor would be really kind of interested in this. I would imagine that, I mean, there are about to be new leaders at UC and CSU, right? And that seems like a propitious opportunity. I would imagine that the legislature, kind of understanding how much higher ed is central to the future of California's economy, would be interested in this. So it feels to me like a lot of roads lead right back to Sacramento, where I think UC Davis probably has terrific alumni placed in key positions. And my hope is that it doesn't take another 50 years. I do think that one piece of that conversation ought to really leverage local communities that depend on and benefit from these institutions. We have so many more CSU campuses now than we did when I was growing up even, let alone when the master plan was created. So how do we engage all those places like Chico and San Jose and you know, Fresno in, in a conversation about what they need and want from their universities? I think that would be really exciting. I kind of want to go back to what you were talking about with DACA. Um, I've taken a couple like constitutional politics classes, and I know you were talking about how so much is going into that case, so complex. But um, as a justice, what kind of precedent do you think we should look at in sort of um, looking at so what can we expect from this case? What do you think that the Supreme Court justices are kind of looking at? I'm going to give you an answer that sounds like a dodge, but only because I'm, I'm careful not to get into talking about current pending litigation, even if it's not in my court, I think, because you never know how that sprawls and could end up creating some, some ripples that affect California law. But I will say this. So I teach administrative law, which is one of the subjects that has the most boring sounding names in law school, but it's like all about the question you are asking, and it's a perfect subject because so administrative law, as Raquel knows, because you have taught it too and write about it, it's kind of like about when government has to do something, how does it actually do it? Like who has the power to do what? Who has the authority? What are the limits of those authorities? What happens when there's a disagreement between the people who have power? So who has the power to do what and why? That's administrative law. One great thing about teaching administrative law is that you benefit from low expectations because most students come in thinking it's going to be really boring, but they have to take it. And then they find out that it's about national security and it's about public health and it's about how clean this drinking water is and it's about DACA and then they perk up and they're excited about it and that's not what they expected. So, um, so in thinking about how I would approach the curriculum in that class, I would say it has been an interesting process to see how concerns and anxieties about executive power, and in the federal context about presidential power, have gone across the parties over time. If you go back to the Roosevelt administration, many of the arguments that people later made to critique George W. Bush during the aftermath of 9-11 about how much the president was doing without explicit legal authority those were the arguments being made against Franklin Roosevelt. And I ended up actually writing a book that was very much about this and about how Roosevelt dealt with those criticisms, sometimes imperfectly, sometimes very wisely and, and politically in a savvy way. But so like you can trace this from Roosevelt through Truman, through Johnson, through um, to some extent even uh, Reagan, but especially like once you get to George W. Bush, Obama, and now the current president. Like that anxiety is on multiple sides. And I guess I would say it's hard to imagine any conversation about DACA where it's lost on the decision makers that that's the backdrop they're writing against, that this is not, they don't view it as an immigration. Many of them may not view it as an immigration case primarily, but as a case involving the power of the executive branch and the, uh, the need for society to be thoughtful about what those limits are, right? On the one hand, if you set limits that are too strict, then an executive may not have the power to say, hey, 
Congress has asked us to stop everybody who's committing this kind of criminal or civil offense, but only given us the resources to go after 20% of them. How could we not set some priorities about who we should go after, right? Who's a low-level offender and who isn't? On the other hand, the concern being, oh, you know, I'm the president, so irrespective of what Congress has said, I'm going to rewrite this and do it my way, right? So I, I, I'm so, I would have more to say, but I think this is about as much as I should say. But it's a really good question. Our mic holder, by the way, is getting a great workout. I just see how fast you're running. Uh, thank you again for speaking to us uh, so honestly and, and um, with your heart. I'd like to ask you about um, your general um, opinion about uh, the, the large percentage of um, inmates in, in the prison industrial system in California. And, and that many of them, a large percentage of them, are people of color, men of color, and women of color. And what, what are your thoughts about why that is and how we can, as a society, begin addressing that issue? Thank you. So California, so there are, it's, it's a great uh, challenge and opportunity to feel like on the court, we're right in the middle of a process of dealing with the interpretation of a whole bunch of different initiatives that voters have recently enacted in the last few years, as well as some policy changes that come from the executive branch and the legislature that reflect this sort of arc in the policy of California. California has often been an innovator in criminal justice. But if you go back two generations, the innovation was often around taking laws that were strict and making them more strict and more harsh and very punitive and adding, for example, enhancements to the punishments people were getting. So if you committed an assault, that might be a certain punishment. And you know, eventually that went from being indeterminate to determinate, which increased the number of years for most uh, inmates. But then on top of that, there might be an enhancement if you use gun. And then on top of that, there might be an enhancement if you were doing this in association with or for the benefit of the gang. So suddenly you have something that was already punished, you know, not, not super leniently, but it's now the enhancements that drive an incredibly staggering punishment. And that was California to some degree two generations ago. Now California is kind of at the other end of the spectrum going at a fairly fast clip, I would say, towards recalibrating the system. And you can begin to see a picture which is in no way perfect for dealing with the issues you're raising, but it's very consequential historically. There's realignment, there's Prop 36, there's Prop 47, there's um, any number of other sort of changes in the law involving different criminal offenses and enhancements. And all of that together is creating, I would say, I'm kind of an optimist, so I would put it this way, it's creating an opportunity for us to rethink carefully what, as the law requires, some basic ideas about how we run criminal justice in California. And you, uh, this includes even things like, well, now clearly the legislature is interested in the level of transparency of a police record. So there's like, there are a lot of things that are happening. And I would say it's careful for us to try to get this right, to follow the law as much as we can, but also maybe for the policymakers and people who control the budgets to think about the big picture. And I think a crucial piece of the big picture for me includes that when we have so many people that may have an opportunity to go home, that does require a support structure around them. Because you know, part of what also has kept a lot of people incarcerated from different communities is that parole, probation work in a certain way that you know, technical infractions and violations can land you right back in there. So like, how do we build a support structure so that when prisoners come home, they can be integrated, they can be supported, they can be supervised where needed, they can be you know, helped to these opportunities in education, they can find where in the California Higher Education Master Plan they belong. And if we do all of that right, my hope is we can show other states what's possible. Hi. Um, I, was, uh, I was wondering if you're in a position to say if there's maybe a case that you wouldn't mind having before you that could precipitate possibly a, a, a kind of change in the higher education landscape that might be needed or that might allow us to get where we want to go? I think I, think I should 
I should probably just say that it's a good thing that our courts provide access to justice to all Californians and that we have millions of cases and disputes in California, but we have a good system that includes our courts of appeal to go from like six million disputes, you know, they work on 30,000 or so. And that gap, is, it concerns me because a lot of people who might have appealable issues need to work with a good lawyer in order to get it to the court of appeal. They need a transcript and so on. But then, of course, at the Supreme Court, we have to deal with thousands of petitions and select a very small number of cases that we can give full review on and grant, like, like write a full opinion on. There are other cases we may not grant review on, which you might transfer back to the courts of appeal, or we might, you know, depublish or do something technical with. But about, you know, 80, 90, 100 cases are only the ones we are, the, that, those are the only cases where we can write a full opinion. And, and if you were to ask me, for example, well, what determines which of those cases among the many that are, you know, brought before you in a petition do you actually select? I would say there are a couple of factors. For example, we look carefully at whether this is a case that affects a lot of Californians or a small number. We look carefully at how likely it is that this dispute will arise over and over again, rather than be something isolated that just has to do with a historical issue. We look particularly at whether there is a split in the courts of appeal. We have six judicial districts with different courts of appeal. And if, for example, the Court of Appeal in LA has decided one thing, and the Court of Appeal in San Francisco has decided another. So just to give you an example from a past case, so let's say the question, which is a difficult question in higher ed, is what responsibility does a college have to protect a student from being attacked by another student? And when can we say the university actually has a duty to protect that student? Like what might be enough information for the university to actually have to act? If the San Francisco appellate court, the first district court of appeal, has decided that different from the second district court of appeal, that like makes the case skyrocket in our estimation of whether it's important to grant review. It is not necessarily an absolute condition to granting review. We sometimes grant review on cases of first impression that have just come up and don't have a split in districts, but it really helps a lot. And that's probably as much as I can say. Yeah, I know you're interested in technologies. So what are you thinking about sentencing software, probation software? How are, how are we going to balance those technologies in the courts uh, today? What do you or jurists need to think about before they use them, before you adopt it, et cetera? So what's your thinking in that area? Thank you for the question. I'd say um, to, to give a little bit more context, your excellent question really is uh, timely because California is among several states that are grappling with the fact that when somebody is arrested, brought before a judge, the really, like one of the really important things a judge then has, magistrate then has to decide is, is this person going to be detained or not? We have normally approached those questions using bail, you know, the idea of like, do we set bail, do we deny bail, and at what level, and those issues are under some litigation. But the backdrop is that clearly California is not alone, other states too, have wanted to see if maybe technology can help us be more fair, more accurate, more reliable when we make these determinations. How might we use data to be thoughtful about the way we do this? It's a big, big thing to say to somebody, even while you're waiting for trial, you're gonna be locked up. And I would say three things. I would say learn, be careful, and be honest. Those are the things that I would want for any system that experiments with this. So learn first. I think what we have already learned in our exposure to computers is that they rarely perform exactly as they're designed to, to perform, right? So it, it borders on madness not to want to do some pilot projects where different kinds of software with different user interfaces are used in different places. That's for starters, right? Now obviously setting some standards too of like what degree of transparency, what degree of disclosure of data, how much should this be auditable so that we know like what the basis is. Second, I would say um, be, be cautious because we know from a lot of research in people's relationship with technology that people will sometimes not trust enough, but more often in certain contexts they might over trust technology. They might think that because something shows up on the screen with a patina of deep legitimacy that that's kind of it, right? 
And somebody might think, well, I'm still an independent decision maker. I'm weighing the recommendation of the software. But they might be so influenced by that that their own independent judgment begins to shut down. And then third, be honest. I think we need to honestly realize that we're a little stuck when we deal with human decision makers because human decision makers are just both biased, but they're also heroic in that they are part of a system of conversation where we justify decisions to each other using a common language that we understand, right? If you were to ask why the California Supreme Court decided something, you could read an opinion where we are forced to justify our decision to the public in language that even a non-lawyer should be able to understand, right? The software is not working at the same level. And the gap that I'm most concerned about is between the mathematics of how software evaluates data and how that decision is then represented to the decision maker or the public. What words are used? Like what relationship really exists? And I think the relationship is often a little vague and tenuous. And technology contractors don't always have like the best way of being accountable that way. So I'm hopeful that we can gain some benefit from it, learn something, maybe avoid implicit biases, but we got to do a lot of testing and pilot projects before we scale up. I think we have time for one more question. Joe, you get the next. Thanks. So um, in the last year, we received two executive orders that have come from um, the administration to have pushed us to continue as public institutions to support free speech, student expression on our campuses. Um, yet, what advice do you have as public institutions to where we can find that balance of, of supporting our students who are impacted by some of the speakers that come to campus, um, some of the conversations that are happening between faculty, students, and et cetera? Um, what advice or what lessons learned for yourself? Because you mentioned earlier, you know, in order for us to be able to make big change, we sometimes have to interact with those who are very much different from us, so. I'm actually uh, appreciative of being able to end on that question because it's, of all the things we've talked about, I've, we've talked about a lot of difficult issues, but this feels to me like one of the most difficult. And I, I don't have a silver bullet. I have a kind of, mostly my message is I, I join up with all of you and all of us who are trying to get this right but let me say a couple things that I think are helpful. I think we who are in the educator position have to model the behavior we wanna see from our students. We gotta have friends who disagree with us, who are willing to have hard conversations with us. Uh, I think we uh, need to constantly remind our students and our faculty colleagues that while respect is a very important value and ought to be continually sort of um, reinforced um, in different ways in a campus community that's got to be balanced with an ability to hear different points of view and perspectives and if people feel disrespected or personally attacked as a result that there are ways of dealing with that short of saying I'm shutting this down I'm canceling I'm tuning out or I'm actually even just to go even further I'm actually going to ask my network of people to to disengage with this person because um, one of the reasons why that is so fraught is because, to, to reiterate something I said earlier, it's not like there are a whole bunch of other institutions out there where this is constantly worked on. It's like universities and kind of courts, and then that's sort of it. Like, yeah, maybe other kinds of schools, like, like high schools to some degree, but I think the reason this feels so hard in universities is that we are actually in each other's faces. Like, we're proximate physically, and we are trying to have a conversation with each other. And once you get out into the workplace or into the political world or into you know, social life, generally, people can self-segregate and technology, I think, has mostly only sped that up, right? So this is where we're pushing against the tide, or that's a bad metaphor, swimming against the current, I think is what I'm trying to say. And, uh, and it would be pretty shocking to me if that felt really easy, right? Like it's gonna be hard. And I don't want to minimize the degree of uh, insult and shock that people feel when they s hear something from a fellow member of their community that makes the person who's hearing it feel like they have just been, you know, disrespected, like they've just been called somebody less than human. Um, but I think we need to find ways to um, 
to push forward and to, to find a way to say, like, I need to share with you the hurt, but I also want to share with you that I, I imagine there's a point you're trying to make and I'm going to try to see if I can see that what of it I think we can actually have a conversation about. Let me, let me just end with a hopeful anecdote. I have often been blessed with opportunities to remember how difficult it actually is to do what I just said. Um, and I have not always succeeded at doing that. Um, but I, I look back on some places where I feel like I can point to successes that I had a small part in, but I had some part in, like the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, or the reduction in disparities in sentencing between crack cocaine and powder cocaine, where an absolutely critical piece of the strategy was to say to people, I respect you, but I don't think we agree on a lot of stuff. But we agree on this, so let's work together. And going forward, I will just say, I will always remember my former colleague, Catherine Werdegar, a graduate of the University of California system, who, uh, when I joined the court, was the, the most senior member of the court. And she was the first person ever to share with me that she disagreed with me on something, but to stay open-minded long enough that I persuaded her before we finally had to make a final decision. And the grace with which she listened to me and said to me, I still think you don't have this right. I think I'm still in dissent mode. And then one day she said to me, yeah, I think you've kind of convinced me that it's probably the right thing to do. You've also switched your position a little, you know, and, and accommodated my concerns. Uh, whenever I am especially certain that my colleagues are wrong uh, and that they're just being obstinate and not seeing the light, I try to remember Justice Wardegar and think about what she taught me. Uh, join me.